Uh, the topic is the definition of the situation, and I'll explain what that means shortly. It's a very widely used concept in sociology. It's been around for a long time. It turns out to be incredibly useful in a lot of ways, and this is our topic for the day. Um, so um, you'll see that in our discussion, which is not covered on the podcast, um, we'll be talking more in more detail about some of the philosophical arguments underlying all this stuff. The lectures will tend to be, how to say, lighter, uh, with you know a few more laughs and that kind of business. Okay. Uh, last time, I started off by saying. I live in a meaningful world and tried to explain what that sentence could mean by going through I live in and so on and so on and use that as a way of introducing the phenomenological interpretation of everyday life. Right? So that was just an intro to that. Uh, one of the things we said is that when I say I live in a world, or in a meaningful world, that's a coherent kind of experience that I look around and there are people and there are objects and there are things that I work with and uh, uh, I have my goals and I have my relatives and friends and so on. And that whole world is coherent for me, right? It makes sense. Kind of all fits together. And it works, right? And I can also do things in that world. So I know, as I said last time, I can go to New York City. I know how to get there. Right? Like, I mean, if you drop me in the middle of the countryside, tell, told me to go to New York City and walk, I would have a terrible time. Couldn't do it, right? I don't know. I don't know north from south, pretty much. Okay, the sun's over there. That's not the way we operate. We have a whole system of methods of dealing with our world that work pretty well. You know, you drive to the train station, you get on the train, get stuck in Albany for three or four hours, <laughs> get to New York. I don't know, you pop up in Penn Station or whatever. And then when I step out and I want to take a cab, hold up my hand, right, some random person I've never met shows up and says, where do you want to go? And he takes me. And I get there and he hadn't mugged me yet. So even though he's a total stranger, right, and I know that if I want, I can get food. I can walk in these places called restaurants. And I'll say, uh, uh, I'll take the, uh, I don't know, pasta with pesto or something. And they bring it. It's kind of cool. And then I give them some paper, and they're happy. And I pull out my wallet and give them something, and it works. Or I give them a credit card. You know, I give them a little piece of plastic. Next thing you know, they're like, fine, great, have a nice day. I mean, that's like magic, see? So I can gear into this world and get things done and make stuff happen. And that's kind of where we're starting today. That, that I live in a world, okay, probably different from yours in some respects, but very similar in a lot of ways. I can't get out of it. I'm stuck, right? As I said, I'm, it's inescapable for me that I was born in 1953. There's no way around that. You have the same problem. You were born at a specific time and place and know certain people. That's it. And you kind of have to deal with it. And so we, we operate within the world uh, and we're stuck in it. And Sartre would say, okay, that's who we are. Okay, I am this specific person stuck in this specific world. There's no real me in the background. All right? He doesn't believe in the soul, for instance. Okay, there's no special version of me that's back here behind it all making stuff happen, which is kind of the way we tend to think, right? We talk about people having personalities. The whole idea of a personality is that there's a real you that's kind of fundamental. And all that you're doing is just kind of an outgrowth of that. That you just give off certain behaviors, like a piece of radioactive metal gives off whatever it is they give off. Neutrons or iodines or something. I don't know. I have no idea. 
But they give off stuff. I know that part. But Sartre would say that's not the way it works at all. All you are is who you actually are. That's it. Okay? Uh, now, again, that violates or goes against a lot of the Western tradition in philosophy. You know, back to Plato and all, if you know anything about that. But we're not getting into that right now. All right? So here I am. I'm stuck in the world. Part of being stuck in the world, in that phrase, that, that I just made up, okay, it's just years ago, but it sort of works. It's a little misleading, because I'm not actually stuck in the world like I could be unstuck. Because, I, because there's no gap between me and the world. Does that make sense? So I'm here, but I wasn't put here. Here didn't exist until I showed up, is more like it. Okay, so I'm stuck in the world, but I'm also alive. Right? I do things. I can't avoid doing things, even if it's lying in bed all day pretending not to do things. So I'm inescapably committed to doing stuff in the world all the time. No way out of it. Okay. All right, next step. Good news is, as we said, I know how to do things. There are methods. There are techniques for what Alfred Schutz called gearing into the world. Right, I can hook into the train system and the taxi system and go into restaurants and showing up for classes. I know how that works, and I know that when my little gears turn, something out there will turn in response. So I talk, you take notes. Nice, huh? It's a very nice system. All right. and, and I have then uh, kind of standard order recipes for doing, for doing things. So it's like I got a little box and all my little recipes, and it says, okay, teach a class. And I go to the T, and I pull it out. It says, have notes. Right? Do an outline. Write stuff on board so students think something's going on. Right? You know, have assignments. Tell students, you know, read this. Okay? And it's listed. It's as if they're listed on these recipe cards in my head of how to get things done. And it can be for all sorts of stuff. It can be for um, um, how to meet people. You know, you walk up, hello, my name's Dan. How are you? And I kind of know what they're going to do. They'll go, oh, hi. Even if they don't want to meet me. Right? Because, again, there's this kind of gearing into the world thing where I say certain things, most people will respond appropriately. That's pretty nice. And then I say, oh, would you like to have lunch? And they're like, uh, uh, okay. Because they can't think of a way out of it, maybe. You know? The next thing you know, we're like falling in love or something. Because there are methods for doing that. Right? You all kind of, if I ask you to write down, do a little paper, you could probably say, okay, step one, step two, step three, step, <laughs> step, step four. Right? You kind of know how it's supposed to progress. And so do a lot of other people, right? Which is why you can gear in with them and get stuff done. Which is a great thing, right? How to make a phone, how to say happy birthday, how to have fun. So if I ask college students, if I ask you folks, how do you have fun? I'll bet I could predict, you know, let's say two or three of the top ten, at least. Because there are standard things you think of as having fun. And this is how it's done. Right? And again, there's a broadly shared consensus about what that typically counts for. Although you may not, I mean like me, having fun <clears throat> is sitting in the bathtub reading Merleau-Ponty's preface to the phenomenology of perception. <laughs> who's to, who's to, right? I mean that's kind of strange. But there I am, and my wife's in, outside in the bedroom, like, what are you laughing at? I, this is great. <laughs> See? So I'm fine with that. You know, I recognize people have different ideas of fun. And once in a while, I meet people. Like, I just went out to Las Vegas. I told you this, right? Went to Las Vegas for the ASA meeting. I'm sitting with this guy from Amsterdam for a couple hours.
talking about Merleau-Ponty. He loves it. He sits in the tub and reads Mer Right? I don't know. He, he didn't say that part. <laughs> but but he, lo he really likes talking about this stuff, too. You know? And so you find people whose idea of fun matches yours. Right? But again, there are these kind of recipes for how to do these things. Okay. All right. Now, if you think about that, what that means is you can act in the world. Right? You're alive. You're stuck here. You've got to do something. You can act in the world and get things done because you have these recipes, right? They're kind of a, a box full of them, so to speak. Um, but you can use those because, because the world is not just a, a random chaos of, of disconnected individual happenings. There are types of things going on, and you can see those types. So you can, for instance, notice that a certain type of automobile is painted yellow, and that means it's a cab in New York, and therefore you wave for it and it'll stop. Okay? You don't care about the differences between cabs. You just care, oh, there it is, it's yellow, that's my thing. Or you meet someone and you say, let's have lunch. Okay, it's a certain, it's a person, you know, it might be a person of a certain age or sex or whatever you want to meet, right? So you, you type people. And this is true of everything. We, to use a verb, we typify all sorts of stuff in the world around us. Right? We typify stuff. That means for all intents and purposes, like all the chairs in this room that you're sitting in, basically are the same. When you come in to sit down, except for their location, I recognize that. Right? But basically the chairs themselves, you don't care about the differences. Right? You suppress the differences between the chairs. Right? This, is, uh, this goes to uh, a philosopher named Alfred Schutz, who had a student named Maurice Natanson, who was one of my teachers in graduate school. And they said there's the suppression of differences that goes on when you look out at the world. Okay? Or to put it a little differently, you're not a two-year-old. <laughs> Or a baby. For, for them, everything's interesting. A chair. Another chair. <laughs> right? You know? And they maybe, at first, they don't even know that that's a chair, that that's a chair right? Because even the word is, we would say, anonymizing or typifying. The word is a very general category that applies to all these different things. But a small child might be really attentive to the differences between those different things. See, part of growing up is getting into this pattern of typifying things and realizing, like, oh, there are chairs and there are dogs, you know? And they're not the same. <laughs> and dogs are not cats. And you can't quite treat them the same. I mean, a little bit, but not quite. So children learn to typify the world in pretty standard order processes, right? So my, my granddaughter was telling me, uh, I don't know, six months ago or something, about the differences between boys and girls, right? She's, and Zinnia, her doll, is a girl, and Mommy's a girl, you know, and I'm a girl, she said, and you're a boy. I'm like, cool. <laughs> right? So she's learned this stuff in very discreet way. Okay. Um, so anyway, so you recognize types of things and people, and then you can deal with them. So you walk into the classroom, you see me, you go, oh, professor looking type. So my first... Uh, Wow, 15 years. As a professor, I had a beard. Very good professor type thing. Especially when you're 25. You know, oh, he, he's got a beard. Must be the professor. <laughs> you know, I had my little notebook. I look kind of official and write stuff on the board. Go, okay. So once you know that's a professor, and that's the relevant thing, then you can gear in and get things done and do what you're supposed to. And so on. Okay. All right. So. Point number, major point number one, typification, this ability to classify things, let's say, as a start, is typification is the key to the everydayness of the world. That's a kind of slogan um, that comes from Schutz, Alfred Schutz, who died in 1961. He was born in, I think, 1900, actually. 
Yeah. Okay. Simplification is the key to the everydayness of the world. If we didn't have this ability as part of our normal way of seeing things, we'd be a total mess. You'd be seeing everybody is different and everything, every situation is new. Like, <gasps> a yellow car, what do I do? All right? You wouldn't know how to, how to deal with stuff. All right, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with that and then go to situational definition. All right, number one, you classify so you can deal with things. You suppress differences. That's what we already talked about. And for the most part, what's interesting there is that, like, for all practical purposes, this marker is like every other black marker in the building. I don't, I don't care, again, I don't care about the differences. Um, sometimes people care about the differences. And you can have a hobby, for instance. So my, um, uh, my stepson is a very avid fly fisherman. Right, and knows a tremendous amount of detail about fly fishing, like all the different flies, and he makes you know his own. And, uh, you know, he has this kind of weight and this kind of feather and this kind of situation. He uses it here, here, and, and then there are all these different kind of leaders and lines and plummets and figurines. I don't know. There's all this terminology. I don't know. I just made up the last couple of them. <laughs> but it sounds like that to me. I mean, at a certain point, it just becomes gibberish. I don't know. He seems to have all this rich detail, and he really enjoys figuring about that stuff and learning how it works and so on. That's what being an expert is. Right? Some of you may be baseball fans and you're all into all the esoteric of baseball. Right? But most people, most of the time, you don't worry about all those complexities. There are actually books. Have you ever seen these? They're actually, you can go to a big, good library, books about toilet design. I'm not making this up. I mean, I'm saying books like this, color photos. Diagrams, angles, curves, toilets. <laughs> right? I mean, there are people whose job it is, reasonably enough, right? Thank heavens for them. I'm glad we have them. People who spend their lives studying how toilets are designed so as to design better toilets in all sorts of ways. Better. Okay? But most of us, most of the time, who cares, you know? That trivialization of differences is kind of an accomplishment of consciousness. It's one of the miracles of our brains, you might say, that we can not pay attention to stuff. We cannot pay attention to stuff. All right. Second point on typification. Types are reciprocal. Okay, now we start getting into really something more like sociology. Um, when you type yourself, you type other people around you as well. If I think of myself as a professor and try to act that way, I need students. It's very hard to be a teacher without students. You can be a student without having teachers, but you can't be a teacher with no students. It just doesn't really work. Right? So maybe they exist in your mind for some time. Uh, being a father and a child, same kind of thing. I say lock and key here is kind of the analogy. But this, this um, reciprocity of me with the world applies not only to social relationships, which we'll get into when we talk about roles, but it applies even to our physical circumstances. Well, obvious case. I'm not a super healthy guy, but I'm a lot healthier than most men my age in the United States, partly because I'm a professor. And professors are the healthiest occupational group in the United States. Nice job, right? In other words, in another, in another sense, you could say, you can look at me physically and figure out a lot of things about my job. No calluses. No missing fingers. OK? You make carpenters. Very hard to find a carpenter without a missing finger. Right? I'm just telling you, or something like that. Scars of various sorts. Cooks. A lot of cooks have scars, you know, from cuts and burns. Very common. Very common situation. Any line of work, you can do this. You can look at the body and see the way the person has fitted together with the world. A friend of mine, Mary McManus, um, in graduate school, was a historian. And she spent all day medieval history. Right? 
spent all day in the archives in the Yale Library. And she had this enormous callus on this finger right here. I'm holding a pencil like this all day long as she copied out medieval manuscripts. And it was showing, by the age of 25, it had shown up on her body. She was a historian. Right? So we, we gear ourselves into the world, and, and they fit together, like historian, you know, certain type of body, as the types fit together. My favorite sort of general example of this kind of thing, you can't be nice without somebody who accepts it. You can't be nice without somebody who accepts it. Suppose you're trying to be nice, and you say, oh, what a lovely shirt you have on today. And the person goes, as if I don't usually. Are you telling me, like, oh, got dressed up today? <laughs> no, no, that's not what I meant. Oh, patronizing, are we? <laughs> and you know, because you, you probably met people, there are these people who you can't be nice to them because they won't accept it. They get offended. They get offended or hurt somehow. Anything you say is wrong. Right? Just as you, you can't be funny without somebody to laugh. Who laughs, right? If you, you're sitting there in commons and you tell a funny story and everybody just kind of goes, <laughs> right? You're not funny. And then you try again. Now they think you're really, you know, like, give it a rest. Okay? okay? So to be a certain kind of person, any kind of person, you have to have other people, in a sense, supporting that. All right, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, in a way, this is saying that I define myself by my relations with the world, right? With objects, with other people, and so on. All right, number three, and I'll get to the being in the world thing shortly. All right, number three. The typified world is anonymous. Okay, this is a little bit hard. Uh, what that means is... So I live in a particular world and so on, but it's very similar to other people's. And the fact that we use these typifications kind of tells you that it's not absolutely, specifically, particular to me. Okay, so if I'm a professor and you're a student, those are very general categories that have been around for thousands of years. Okay, there's nothing particularly unique, nothing at all unique about that. Right? But that's how I plug into the world, is through these anonymized categories. And so um, that has all sorts of ramifications. Even things like your name are kind of typified. All right, so there are probably a couple of Matts in the room, you know, guys named Matt. Okay. There are there's several. There are Kates. I don't know. We got Kates in here. I'm just pulling these out of the blue. Kates or uh, yeah, any, no Catherines. No Catherine of any sort here? No, no Catherine. All right, never mind. There's a will, right? Are there more than one will? I haven't learned. Oh, yeah, I haven't, see, I haven't, haven't done the names yet. I just sent it off to the. Um, names are anonymous, more or less. So you've got your first name, your last name. If you Google your first and last name, you Google your whole name, you'd be amazed. Sometimes there are people in, in the country who have the same name. As you, it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. Um, but even using a name is a kind of somewhat anonymizing experience. Um, let's say you, you pull out your recipe card for falling in love with somebody, and this happens. It's a great thing. And at first, you call this person uh, Catherine. I'll just say, okay, okay, I've fallen for Catherine. And then I call her Kathy, though. Everybody calls her Kathy. And at a certain point, it's like, I call her just, it's with a K. So I just call her K, you know, like a kind of little nickname -y thing. <laughs> and then, you know, it's like, Snookums. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, at a certain point, it's like, hmm, hmm. And then at a certain point in the relationship, it might be sort of rude to use any name at all. 
this name. Because a name kind of gives a little bit of distance from the person you're talking to. And it might be inappropriate. But sometimes then, you know, you have a little little tiff. I'm like, Kay, <laughs> Catherine, right? Like when your parents, I don't know, there's, I was watching baseball last night. You know, Chipper Jones plays for the Atlanta Braves. You know Chipper Jones? He's, he's good. Getting a little old, but uh, old is okay. Mature. So Chipper, I'll bet when he was a kid, his parents called him Chipper. Except when his mom got really mad. And she'd say, Larry Leroy Jones Jr., get up here. She'd use this very formal name as a way of saying, don't try to pull nicey-nice with me. You know, I'm, I'm separating myself from you a little bit by using your formal name as a hint to, like, now I'm going to wallop you or something. <laughs> All right? So a name, the formalization of a name can provide distance between people because it's an official sort of statement. Okay. Alright, so what do we got? Um, this occurs spontaneously, you don't have to think about it. Uh, types go together, well we sort of talked about that a little bit, sort of. I'll give you a hint, we're going to talk about this a lot more later on, but when I say types go together, uh, for instance, in a situation, a, just a setting with people, we have um, uh, certain kinds of people, right? a certain time boundary to this situation, right? a certain physical setting, there are objects that go with it, etc. Right? You could write a description of this class and list out the different types of things that exist in this setting. And we recognize that they go together. It would be very strange, for instance, you go to uh, cheap example. You go to a Bundy party and you put up a PowerPoint. People think it's a joke or something goofy. Or you go to a Bundy party and you see a professor. <laughs> Extra weird, right? And you know what students do when that happens? You know what they do? So they've got their gear. You know, they're equipped. They, they've got the, they do this. They do this. <laughs> They smile, because it's a professor, right? They smile. <laughs> they do that. That move just appears every time. If I ever show up at student parties, which I used to do a lot, actually. <laughs> See, that's funny in itself, right? So there's tells you something about humor. We talked about the first day, about what makes something funny. There's something about incongruity. Professor, not supposed to be at a Bundy party. Not supposed to be at Club DU. Dancing in the cage. <laughs> but sometimes weird things happen. I'll tell you. <laughs> Not recently. <laughs> Not recently. Um, at any rate, okay. So, um, big point no, <laughs> next. So, but, in, but every situation has a kind of coherence. And then funny things happen. You know, something weird occurs. And you go, that's not the way it's supposed to be. But let's say that if you approach any social situation, an encounter, Irving Goffman would call it, any group of people together at some place, one of the, the first thing you do is you type the situation. You try to say, what's going on here? And the answer to that question is what sociologists call the definition of the situation. Okay, the, the phrase was coined by a guy named W.I. Thomas in 1923, and he said, along with giving the phrase, he said, situations defined as real are real in their consequences. Uh, this, is, this turns out to be a very powerful piece of understanding. That is, what people think is going on in a setting actually has profoundly serious consequences, even if they're wrong even if their initial assumption was wrong. So if you come into a setting and, for instance, people are trying to be nice to you, but you think they're, they're teasing you or making fun of you, <coughs> you start acting that way and it can have profound consequences. All right? Situations defined as real are real in their consequences. Okay, let's talk about definition of the situation. In any situation, there's this question going in 
It doesn't have to be explicit. And it may not even be a question. You may just automatically assume things by where the setting is. You walk into the red pit, it's a class. You know, you know the time, the place, you figure, you walk in. Oh, things are normal. It's, you know, here we are. All right? Definition of the situation answers the question, what's going on here? So uh, I guess I picture you're eating lunch or dinner with your friends in the dining hall. And somebody starts making little jokey remarks about, I don't know. Let's say you have a blemish on your face that's becoming apparent. You know, a pimple begins to emerge. And they start saying, oh, nice pimple. You're like, <laughs> everybody, and a little jokey jokey about it or something. And sometimes in that situation, you watch and you can see the recipient of these remarks at a certain point starts thinking, maybe this isn't jokey jokey. Maybe this is just kind of being nasty. <laughs> We're just having fun. Right? And you're not quite sure which it is. And the situational definition hangs in the balance. Right? So you look for signs to interpret or signals about what's going on here. Right? So leaving the, the jokey jokey thing, you meet somebody. And you want to know, is this person going to be a normal person? Will I be able to deal with them? So you walk up and you say, hi, my name's Joe. Try a handshake. OK, the person shakes your hand like, OK, they got the basics. You know the person on the other end at least understands what this is about. Right? Or they say, hello. And you go, hello. OK, we got something going here. <laughs> It's not huge, but it's something. And it's really important. This is serious now, right? It's uh, really important that you do that stuff, even though it looks like it's nothing. Because what it does, it tells the other person, you kind of know the basic rules of the road. Which is why I always try. Now, this is an upper level class. okay? But in intro especially, and certainly with freshman advisees, I always try to be real normal. because. <laughs> I'm not. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sort of weird. I, I have some funny mannerisms. But, um, but when I first meet freshman advisees, I'm like, oh, hello, Kelsey. Come in, please. Have a seat. How can I help you? And I'm, just, I'm just all like this until Kelsey thinks, OK, he's not going to like do something weird, you know, and jump out the window or something. I don't know. There's no telling. You're in a new situation. You want to know that people are normal. It's real important, by the way, when you first meet little kids. First meet little kids. Don't be weird. Don't go ironic. It doesn't work. It's not good. They think, oh, scary person. Grant, you can, hello, how are you today? Oh, isn't that nice? And they're like, okay, you know. <laughs> and then, they, then you can move on from there. I, I went to a conference years back with a whole bunch of educators, um, education leaders from K all the way through college, from kindergarten all the way through college. And the college people were kind of like me. But the kindergarten people were just crazy. You meet, the, <laughs> you meet a kindergarten teacher, she's like, hello, Dan. <laughs> okay. Hi. <laughs> As you can see, they spent all day basically being sort of normal, nice, you know, to little kids. And it's a different, it's a different style. At any rate, OK. A smile is obviously one common technique. You see somebody, you go, hi. And you know, oh, that works. OK, must be a nice person. Now, it can be incredibly misleading, because you probably know there are people who smile a lot. And so we think they're nice, even when time and again they're not actually nice. Right? Because, but the signal is there, and it's so strong, you just keep thinking, God, they've got to be nice. You know, it's like, you know, seems pleasant enough all the time. It's not, not really working out. OK, Irving Goffman gets into all this stuff, and we'll, uh, uh, we will explore that in much more detail in the next couple of weeks. All right, let's move on to number three here. Elements of the scene are consistent. That is, I said you walk into class, and uh, it's at a certain time. There are certain roles. I'm a professor. You're a student. You know how it works. 
if the time goes funny, I mean, this class lasts an hour and 15 minutes. Suppose it got to be 3.45, 10 minutes to 4, 4 o'clock, 4.30, <coughs> 7. <laughs> you know, people would be like, okay. <laughs> you know, this is not the way class is supposed to go. And, and by midnight, there'd be pandemonium, right? <laughs> like that's just not what, what school's supposed to be like. It doesn't work that way. The same as I had a class in college. We all walked in the first day. It was, there was a time, there was a place. We sat down. Teacher didn't say anything. I mean the whole period. Actually, that's not right. It was the entire semester. She never said a word. The entire semester. Okay. It's kind of like a class. I mean, it's on this, you know, you're looking at the you're looking at the course booklet, like this is, it was group dynamics is what it was. Class. <laughs> well, you got to realize it's like just after the late 60s, uh, <laughs> like teacher experiment kind of thing. <laughs> so we were savvy to that stuff. So a couple of class meetings in, we actually started talking. Pretty soon we had our class going. Teacher didn't, never said a word the entire semester, no joke. No joke. <laughs> Different, totally different example. You see football players on TV. So football is starting up, so pro football. And you see them on TV and they, like, uh, I don't know, some big play or something. And there are these players on the bench and the camera focuses in on players on the bench. And the players see the camera and what do they do? They look down? Is that what they do? I don't know. What, what? They see the camera. They see the camera looking at them. What do they do? So the wave or wink or I don't know. Sometimes just normal. Sometimes just, mm, just keep going, right? Sometimes what, what they what I used to see a lot was they do like, <laughs> and then they see the camera. You know, okay, still on me. So we go, you know, like we're number one, or they go. <laughs> right, you see the high mom, but after five seconds or so, you know, it's like okay, <laughs> you know, like that's about it. I mean, they get kind of up. You know, it's kind of uncomfortable. Camera's only supposed to be on them for a certain amount of time. And people who run TV shows know what that length of time is, how long you can put a camera on somebody and have them feel okay. Or you meet somebody on the path, Martin's Way, classic, you're walking across the bridge. Hey, how's it going? Hey, pretty good, how are you? Not bad. Let's talk. <laughs> you know, well, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, Merleau-Ponty. <laughs> Nominology perception, you know, and the role of the uh, the subconscious, and you're like, I gotta go. <laughs> this is supposed to be a five second encounter, not five minutes, All right? So you have a notion in any situation of how long it's supposed to last, how people are supposed to behave, and so on. But definitions of situations are inherently ambiguous. They're not physical things. They're not written down. There are no laws that state this is what it's supposed to be like and how long it lasts and so on. So there can be a lot of debate about what's going on in any particular situation. Funny stuff starts happening. You go, wait a minute. This isn't actually a class, is it? This is some bizarre social psych experiment that Jen Borton set up. And Chambliss is in league with her. And I'm the stooge. Everybody else in the class is a confederate. Try, they're here to convince me that this is a legitimate subject for intellectual discourse. And I'm a fool. And at the end, they're all going to laugh, you know, and see how I react to various things that happen. That's possible. That happens. Social psychologists make their living off this kind of thing. Right? So there are situational ambiguities. I gave you the example last time about what a Kelly clamp is, a hemostat, forceps and so on. Uh, people try to redefine things. Bill Clinton, when he was president, or before he was president, was asked if he had ever smoked marijuana. And he said, I experimented. Experimented. It's a great word, isn't it? Wearing a lab coat, <laughs> thinking about it, taking notes. <laughs> I don't know if that's the way it actually played out, right? He experimented. Newt Gingrich, who was Speaker of the House at the same time, 
was asked the same question. Did you ever smoke marijuana? And he said, his, his response was, everyone was doing it. Meaning, I mean, so Clinton, his approach is like, you know, I'm kind of a scientific guy. And <laughs> Ging, well, he said that about other things too, by the way. But well, I may have dabbled. <laughs> Where Newt, Newt was kind of pitching himself as just one of the guys, right? Everybody's doing it. You know, in my frat, that's what we did. Okay, you know, and so you have a different picture of these different people that are trying to frame the issue as a certain type of situation. Okay. Oh, is that next? Wow. Okay. Here's another example of an ambiguous situational definition. Magnolia Blonde, a legend in her time. All right, many, many years ago. Many, many, many years ago. Long before you were born or even... You know, a twinkle in anyone's eye or anything. Um, I lived in Phoenix, Arizona in the summertime, which is a really hot place, in multiple senses. And uh, my friend Dave and I used to go out clubbing, you would say now, discotheque. <laughs> well, one thing led to another, and uh, we met some women. And I met this woman whose name was Magnolia Blanc. I mean, she told me that was her name. <laughs> I, think she had a, I think she had a kind of Tennessee Williams thing going, you know? A streetcar named Desire and so on. Um, and Magnolia Blanc. Uh, but that wasn't her real name. Her real name was uh, something else I can remember, but I won't share with you. Anyway, so Magnolia, she was really nice and stuff, and we got along. And uh, we started seeing each other a little bit. Very, very casual, very casual. Uh, at any rate, somewhere, you know, the first or second time I saw her, I mentioned to her that I, I was living in this really trashy little garage, actually, with, a sh with nothing but a shower that would periodically electrocute you because, <laughs> because the water heater didn't work. But anyway, uh, but I missed taking baths because I really liked taking baths. I mean, it was just a thing. And she said, well, you should come over to my house and take a bath. Which seemed like a good idea, right? <laughs> so, um, so one day I went over to Magnolia's house to take a bath. And uh, she had it all set up, right? Like, there was this bathroom with a tub, and, and she had candles, and she had incense burning, <laughs> and she, like, you know, fills the bath and pours in oils of some sort. And then she undressed me and put me in the tub. And then she left the room. <laughs> and, you know, did I miss something? I mean, was I reading too much into the situation? Was I anticipating where I never should have? I mean, it was kind of a big mystery. But there I am in the tub, and I thought, well, you know, might as well enjoy it. So I had a nice bath. <laughs> and that was it. And afterwards, I went out, and she was in the middle of her living room floor doing yoga. And I was, you know, I didn't even want to ask, right? I was too embarrassed. I was like, you know, as it, the definition of the situation, you know, you look for certain signs, you look for indicators, you think you know what's going on, there are recipes, blah, blah, blah. She had just headed way off into Kansas or something. I, it was a total mystery to me. And I never did figure it out. Actually, I, I still can't, I, I'm not sure if she was just like messing with my head, certainly a possibility, or if she was clueless. Or what? It didn't make any sense. But that was, that was what happened. OK. All right. Um, so I don't know the answer to that one. Situations, usually, though, that sort of thing, I mean, that's kind of unusual, right? It just doesn't work out that way. Usually, we have a much better sense of what's unfolding and what things mean and so on. OK. Situational definitions usually are taken for granted. 
uh, we adopt what literary critics call a suspension of disbelief. That is, yeah, it's possible that something weird's happening, but usually we don't have to think about that. All right. So, um, let's see. Uh, the college I went to um, was uh, very, mm, well, I, I don't know how to say exactly. It was kind of, again, late 60s, uh, early 70s, kind of, uh, well, the, the, the newspaper article and the local paper about it once called Rich, Radical, and Hedonistic. All right, so it was a lot of left-wing radical types, uh, although we ran the entire range politically. I mean, a couple of leaders, uh, big shots in the, not big shots, but prominent, reasonably prominent people in the Congress, Republicans are uh, from the school too. Um, uh, but, you know, a lot of drug use and a lot of sex and all that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, there was a theory out there that the whole thing was a CIA plot to get rid of left-wing radicals. That what they do is they take all the wackiest kids from, like, Manhattan is where a lot of my classmates are from, all the left-wing types and stick them in a place in Florida with sunshine and beaches and a lot of pot and take them out of circulation so they wouldn't cause any trouble. And this theory, you know, was kind of kicking around the college. Nobody really believed it until one day uh, a person showed up whose father was the head of the CIA, and she was a student. She's like, oh my God, that's kind of weird. What's she doing here? Um, and that just gave a little credence to the whole thing. But that story doesn't really go anywhere. <laughs> All right. At any rate. <laughs> At any rate. So what am I talking about? <laughs> oh, suspension of disbelief. So most of the time we act like the world just operates the way it's supposed to and we know what the situations are. So, for instance, I think I mentioned money last time. Money, I mean, that's a strange item. It's a very strange item. But it's fascinating and really smart people like Adam Smith have written great stuff about what this is and what it means. So a piece of paper, you know, and it doesn't do anything by itself, but we tend to take it very seriously. <laughs> oh. You can't do that. That's like money. <laughs> See? But it's a piece of paper, which happily, if you scotch tape it together, it's still perfectly good as currency. Just so you know, I didn't actually destroy that $20 bill. <laughs> right? But, the, but see, the gasp from you, like, <gasps> sort of signifies. I mean, it's a symbol of something, right? It's not what it is, it's what it represents that's important, right? There's a, a definition about what objects are and what, how much they count, how much they matter. And people, people uh, grades would be another great example. Um, I mean, uh, get an F sometimes, see what happens. Turns out not much. I mean, a little bit, maybe you get suspended, maybe, from Hamilton, I don't know. But it's nothing. It's a thing, you know, it's just this little indicator someplace. And people take them very, very seriously. You know, a little up, a little down, B minus, B plus, this kind of stuff, right? And I'm not discouraging you from doing that, but I'm saying it, it's somewhat arbitrary how we do that. And that's been created to make that an important thing, has been created. And it's been created socially, and we'll talk about how that comes about. Um, okay. And the use of, of all these objects and the support of situational definitions is carried on through rituals. And we'll have a big shtick about that. Some of you who took intro already have heard one lecture on that, one or two. Maybe American Society, did we talk about that? We're going to do the ritual thing there one day and play the Bon, bon Jovi concert and any of that? Okay. So in this class, we'll do actually four different sessions on this stuff because it's really fascinating. Because rituals, broadly defined, are the key to understanding what things we take, let's say, seriously. What things we treat as real in the social world. Why we tra treat certain values as important. Why we treat certain people as important. Or objects. Okay? So a $20 bill comes to have meaning for people and significance because you watch it being used. And you realize, like, I take one of these, 
I can go to Cafe Opus and have a have a time. You know, like I'm having, I'm gonna have five poppy seed muffins and a, and a junior decaf latte mocha or whatever. Right? You can get stuff, and you hand them a piece of paper, and all this good stuff comes your way. See, and that's powerful. And if you grow up doing that over and over and over and over again, it just becomes the routine way the world works. Right? Okay. Uh, hey, well. I mean, let's go on. Let's go on. I'm skipping a little bit of stuff, but that's okay. All right. Now, what you'll see when you read the Beyond Caring chapters, the chapters are really about how nurses establish a routine of working in the hospital. So you're dealing with incredibly difficult stuff all the time, tragedy and misery and and intimate, embarrassing things and so on. And nurses treat it as routine and no big deal. And the question is, how do they manage to do that? Right? And so part of what you'll see is that the routine, the ability to routinize daily life, is an accomplishment. Now, it doesn't mean you have to do it deliberately, but it's something we carry on and, and have to maintain. And it, turn, it gets revealed in funny ways how this works. Like actors, you ever been in a play? How many of you have ever been in a play? Okay, okay, a lot of people. It's harder than it looks. Okay, because what actors do frequently is try to carry on just perfectly ordinary activities in a totally, totally unordinary situation. All right. You're, all right, your job, Jane, you're supposed to walk across the stage and pick up the telephone. Okay. Okay, Jane, you're on. Okay. <laughs> Hello? Okay, Jane, you got to relax. <laughs> like, there are going to be 500 people looking at me. Jane, walk across the stage, pick up the phone. Turns out to be hard to do. Turns out to be very hard to do ordinary routine activities well, when you're self-conscious. Okay? And so a big part, this, this is a little hint for things to come, a big part of everyday life is not paying attention to stuff. Okay? Say that again. A big part of everyday life and what makes it everyday is you don't pay attention to it. You will discover this uh, graduation. You'll graduate from Hamilton College, and that Sunday morning, you'll walk across the stage in the field house. And you'll be like, I've got to walk across the stage. I'm graduating. <laughs> See? And you'll, you know, and it, don't wear bad shoes that you could fall off of, because it may happen. Right? And you've got to walk across the stage in front of thousands of people and just get it. It's no big deal, except it's a big deal. Right? And it becomes very difficult to pull off. Okay. Um, yeah. Situational definitions, uh, background setting is what that says there. Uh, a sneeze. Okay. Our ideas of the routineness of everyday life are, are quite valuable. Suppose, for instance, you wake up in the morning. Okay, first thing, you wake up in the morning. You ever done this? You got your head at the wrong end of the bed? <laughs> it's a not an unfamiliar experience to some people. Right? You're at the wrong end of the bed, like, oh, <laughs> something's weird. <laughs> right? So, and it takes you a minute to kind of turn the world back around. So, oh, oh, right, okay. Bed, I'm here, that's it, okay, things are fine. Okay, that's good. And then imagine if you had never in your life, never in your life, seen or, or experienced a sneeze. And, and all of a sudden, you're, you're going to, shit. It'd be terrifying. My head just exploded. Right? Call home. This awful thing occurred. 
well, it's a good thing we kind of know. Oh, no, no. And, you know, and your mom, oh, no, dear, that's fine. That's the way it's supposed to happen. That's normal. It's one of those situations, right? But these situational definitions about what's normal and what's supposed to happen can be quite fragile. So uh, there I was in college, again, I'll tell another story, another college story. And uh, uh, Dr. Shartar was his name, uh, really good comp lit professor, actually. And uh, uh, he was, um, uh, we were talking about the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. You're probably familiar with this poem. And he's like reading from it, and he's like, I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear my trousers, I shall wear my trouser bottoms rolled, I think is the way it goes. Wear my trousers rolled. And Charter got, was so excited about this poem, he did this kind of stuff all the time. He was standing on the table at the front of the class, declaiming, you know, I shall wear my trousers, are my trousers rolled? He said, and a student said, no, Dr. Charter, but your fly is open. <laughs> uh, you know, it collapsed. The whole place crashes out in laughter and stuff. And the whole thing fell apart. Right? Well, that happens. So then I go on to grad school, and I'm in a class with uh, uh, a really good sociologist, and um, uh, he had a big beard and mustache and such. And he kind of had a cold. And we start the class, and there's some serious discussion about Max Weber and rationalization of, you know, the capitalist world economy or something. And Fifteen minutes into a three-hour seminar, he sneezed uh, and didn't quite, you know, use the hanky enough or something. And there's this residue in his mustache. <laughs> And for two hours and 45 minutes, <laughs> the graduate PhD students at Yale University had to carry on as if everything was fine, <laughs> talking about you know, the development of capitalism in the Western economy. All well, the professor sat there with a huge booger on his face. <laughs> but we did it. We did it, right? There's a kind of effort to maintain. This is a class. We're graduate students, the eminent professor, you know distinguished, blah, 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 and so on, all of which was true. Okay? Situational definitions are fragile, right? That's the topic here. You overhear gossip about yourself? You think, this has happened to some of you, I'm sure. You're outside a room, you walk up, hear people talking about you, like, oh, shoot, this isn't good. <laughs> this is not good at all. I once, uh, when I was working in, in Phoenix, I told you earlier about Arizona story. I was working for a psychologist, and I needed uh, a recommendation for a graduate fellowship I was applying to. And I asked him if he'd write one. He said, oh, sure. Now, along about this time, I messed up the experiment. <laughs> I, I goofed some of the stimuli for this psych experiment. Had to go back. I lost like three weeks' worth of work and had to go back and start over. Oh, man. But, I, you know, it's okay. It'll make do. And he was very, very nice about it. At any rate, so then I'm at a party at his house because he had all his research assistants over. And something's going on, and uh, we're having this big discussion about the project because it was all the research assistants. And he said, oh, Daniel, he said, we need the data. You know, we want to go look. He said, go to my office, and there's, there's a stack of the, you know, the findings, and just bring them back. And I said, yeah, sure, okay. So I go up to his office. And I pick up, I go, and there's the stuff in his office, and I pick it up, and as I pick it up, underneath I see this recommendation letter, right, for an NSF graduate fellowship, big deal, Daniel F. Chambliss. I'm like, oh, and I'm an honest guy, okay? I mean, my mom taught me never to read, you know, postcards or anything, but, so I pick this up, but I saw enough to see the first line of this recommendation letter which was something on the order of, Daniel used to be a very fine student. Oh. Okay, 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 okay. I'm taking the data back to doctor. Okay. So I go back to the party. I, got, it was, I had to ride my bike, actually. Go back, go back to the party. I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What do I tell him? What do I say to him? Because I felt like I had to tell the guy that I'd seen you know, some little bit of the letter. So I get back, 
And I, give them, I walk back in, and there's this little party of like seven or eight people. And I uh, give, them, give them the stuff, and I said, uh, Dr. Don, that's what we call him. I said, Dr. Don, uh, can I talk to you for just a minute? So we go out in the kitchen. He said, yeah. I said, I have to confess something to you. When I went to your office and picked this up, I saw uh, this letter. I mean, I didn't read it, but I, you know, and I just, and I said, I, I'm absolutely fine with whatever you said. I, it's all true. I mean, on the way back, I just totally, you know, I thought, he's right. You know, I screwed up the experiment. There's no question. I used to do good work, but now, you know, I have some disappointment. So that's fine. It's totally fair. I got no problem with it. And I just wanted to let you know that that's, that's great, and I, but I felt like I should tell you that I had seen it because, I don't know, I just felt funny. And he's standing there like this. So I follow him back in the other room in front of the whole group. And he said, he didn't read it. <laughs> because the letter started out, you know, used to be a fine student, did all his work. Then he started deteriorating. Next thing you know, he got into dope, you know, pretty soon. He's like going out every night with a different girl. I mean, it goes through this whole long litany. <laughs> So the letter started out as if it was serious. And then the idea was I was going to read it and then get caught in this joke. <laughs> so they punked me, I guess is what you'd say. <laughs> that was the idea. But I, I totally missed it anyway. All right. Yeah, joke, all this kind of stuff down here at the bottom. Uh, a lot of other things can be going on in all sorts of situations. Um, I knew a kid in, in uh, high school. He had a car. I didn't. Uh, we were passable friends, but nothing special. And one day I needed a ride downtown after school because my father couldn't come pick me up, so he wanted me to, you know. So I said, Craig, can you give me a ride? Craig's like, sure. So we go out and we get in his car, which he had this big station wagon, and he had all this gear in the back because he was associated. His father was part of the county rescue squad or something. Anyway, they had all this equipment in the back, you know, uh, oxygen tanks and things like that. We get in the car and I sit down and on the on the um, dashboard in front of me is a billy club in a bracket, you know, like a club, like cops get. And then I look over and next to Craig, you know, he's this is next to Craig is a can of mace in a bracket on the door. And I'm like, you know, feeling stuff under the seat. And I look down, there's a sawed-off shotgun under the seat of the car. I'm in ninth grade, you understand? My pal is some sort of, I said, Craig, why do you have all this stuff in your car? And he said, and I quote, there are people out there who'd like to get me. I'm in the car with a psycho. <laughs> It was, it was a very bizarre moment. I thought my friend was just going to give me a ride, you know, not friend, but acquaintance, you know, just give me a ride. I never rode with him again, <laughs> right? So that sort of stuff happens. Or a different example, Jodie Foster. Um, you know who Jodie Foster is? Very fine actress. Long established, blah, blah, blah. Well, Jodie Foster was famous by 1971 or 72 or something. She was 12, I guess, and she won an Oscar the first time. Um, by 1980, I'm in grad school, school. Jodie Foster comes to Yale as an undergraduate. Now, Dan had a huge crush on Jodie Foster. Okay? She was like 18 or something. But I thought she was just, oh my God, she's amazing. You know, if I were made Jodie Foster, I just I wouldn't know what to do. So uh, I was at lunch one day in the um, school of management dining hall sitting there with my friend Diane, who was right across from me like this. And we're just chatting away, and you can see where this is going. <laughs> and I had this fantasy that Jodie Foster was going to sign up for my methods class, sociological research. She wasn't a social major. I don't think she had any interest in such, but I kept thinking she'd shut up. Anyway, she didn't. But there we are eating lunch, and my friend Diane at one point, this, you know, people sit down around us and stuff, and my friend Diane starts doing this, starts going, You know, sort of gesturing with her eyes. 
So I kind of... <laughs> Jody Foster. <laughs> Smack dab next to me in the Yale dining hall. I have to take a drink. <laughs> it was a big... All right. That was the high point of, of my experience with Jody Foster. I never met... She looked like an 18-year-old college freshman. I mean, totally unexceptional. It's not like she came in the room and everybody was like... Woo, woo, woo. Kind of she was just some kid. Uh, at any rate, later that year, John Hinckley, you know who John Hinckley is? John Hinckley tried to kill Ronald Reagan. Okay, Ronald Reagan's walking out of the Washington Hill, and a guy named John Hinckley pulls out a gun, boom, 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 shoots a few times, hit Reagan a couple of times, hit his press secretary. And they asked John Hinckley afterwards, why did you do it? And he said, I did it for Jody. He had a crush on Jodie Foster, and he was trying to impress her. All of a sudden, I'm like, I had nothing to do with this, <laughs> right? You know, just because a couple of guys had a crush on doesn't mean we have anything else in common. But it was kind of embarrassing, I mean, in a weird sort of way, right? That this, you see what I'm saying? The guy tried to kill the president and for a disreputable sort of reason. All right, there's a point to that story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> um, uh, oh, situational definitions and the meaning of a person or the meaning of a relationship. You know, I have a crush on Jody suddenly became a really disreputable thing. That's the point. That's the point. Okay. So, um, there's one other story I wanted to tell you all, I'm sure, but let's see if it fits. Definitions can be challenged. Oh, yeah. Well, there, let's just go to the conclusion here. So there are a lot of different ways. Irving Goffman writes all about this, about how situational definitions are, can, can be not what they appear to be and can be put-ons or jokes or con games or parodies. Goffman wrote a whole book called Frame Analysis where he starts off and says, let's say you walk into a theater. Now, you know it's a theater, right? So what, what do people do in theaters on stage? They pretend that they're other people, right? That's the nature of the game. But, let's, but you walk in, and there are a group of people on stage talking. Middle of the afternoon. And you're like, OK, possibility one is those are people talking. Second possibility is those are people in a play. So they appear to be talking in the usual sense, but we kind of know they're not, right? You know, so they're pretending to be other people talking. Third possibility is they're rehearsing. In other words, they're pretending, you know, they're playing these roles for what will later be a play that tries to mimic people talking. Fourth possibility is they knew I was coming in the room and they said, let's pretend like we're having a rehearsal. <laughs> All right. So Goffman's question is, which of those situations is real? Okay. And this is the harder question. I mean, you know, okay, you know a rehearsal is different from the real play, from the real thing, but even a play is not the real thing, of course. It's what Goffman calls a lamination or a, uh, a keying of the real thing is actual conversation. You follow me? The real problem, though, is how do you tell which is which? All right? So how do you determine at some point, like at dinner, somebody's making what appear to be jokey remarks that could be cruel, how do you decide which it is? That's a serious problem. And that's the sort of thing Irving Goffman tries to deal with, as you'll see in later work. Okay? All right. Let's stop there. Have a good time with Beyond Care and the first two chapters. By the way, this will all come together. I think, I think you'll see how it all starts fitting together within a couple of weeks.